out of a lunch that uh, Ram Goa and, had, and I had in the legendary Koshis in 2003 or 4. And Ram at that time was writing this book, India After Gandhi. And he was feeling lonely because there was nobody else writing about India post-independence. So he said, we need to create a fellowship which gets young people uh, to write about India post-independence. Because otherwise, people only wrote about some ancient stuff, but nobody was writing about the last few decades. Out of that came the idea of the New India Foundation. And uh, it's a foundation whose first purpose was to give fellowships for people to write books. And since inception, 41 fellowships have been given. And 23 books have come out of that. So it's a very high hit ratio. You know, to have that kind of a hit ratio is, is pretty good. And a lot of that go, credit goes to Ram because he would personally uh, not only shortlist the candidates and we had a jury which was did a wonderful job. And then he would actually mentor the writers uh, to write this book. So I think uh, it's a labor of love and led to 25 excellent books covering a very wide and eclectic range of topics. It began with Harish Damodaran's India's New Capitalist. And every year we have had a few books. And many more will come out in, in the future. Uh, in the, the second thing that we did was uh, start the lecture series. And uh, we began this 13 years back. And uh, initially, we sort of rotated it uh, around uh, India. But some maybe seven, eight years back, we said, let's plonk it in Bangalore. And let's create an annual event in Bangalore for uh, uh, Bangaloreans. And that's how it, it, it's happened. We also have uh, a book award. And uh, the first book award uh, was last year. And it's named after Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. It's called the Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay Memorial Book Award. And uh, the winner was Milan Vaishnav and his book about you know, crime paying for elections and so on. And this year, we'll have the second book award. And uh, the shortlisting is going on. And the shortlisting will be announced on August 30th. Now, when we took a decision recently, uh, after the sad passing away of uh, Girish Kanar, to name this lecture after him, and we sought permission from his family. We are, we are very grateful to both Saras and Raghu for giving us permission to use his name. And they're both here also. Thank you for coming here. And we felt that uh, really, we, we were honored that Girish Kannad's name would honor would be part of our lecture series. Girish, I mean, you all know him, playwright, administrator, actor, director, you know, so many roles, activist. And uh, we are very, very happy that this lecture is named after him. I personally know Girish because we had many things in common. Uh, we are both from Sirsi. At least I'm from Sirsi. He grew up in Sirsi. Uh, we both went to Kannada College, Dharwad. Uh, he's my, he was my neighbor in Dharwad. And I first met him when I was 13 years old, and he was 30 years old. And uh, I was still you know, awestruck by him and his command over language, his personality. So I remember him from a very young age. And uh, so I think uh, and we, are, you know, we knew each other. And we all felt that we would do the right thing to name this uh, after Girish Kanar. And that's what we have done. Now. One thing that happened, and I told Ram that, you know, you have named one book award, the book award after Kamla Devi Chotopadhya, who was born Kamla Devi Dharishwar. So she was a Chitrapur Sarasat. And you have named this lecture after Girish Kannad, who is also a Chitrapur Sarasat. And I'm also a Chitrapur Sarasat. I said, don't they think this is extreme parochialism, that you seem to be naming these awards after, you know, people from your community. So he said, you know, what can I do if there are so many talented people in your community? So I said, OK, fine. I buy that. So that's uh, how it started. And I think uh, the another important thing which is coming up, uh, which I think will also remember Girish. You know, Girish, as you know, was a many things, but also a very prolific playwright. And uh, he wrote his last play just, I guess, last year, The Crossing to Talikota, which is the play about the epic battle of Vijayanagar in 1565 between the Vijayanagar Kingdom and the Sultanates of the Deccan. So very happy that that play is being produced. We would have liked to have done the play while Girish was here, but that was not to be. Uh, but Arjun Sajnani is doing this play, and uh, 
it will be in i think chaudhaya from uh, october 2nd to 6th and it's going to be a huge production it's looking very very promising so please mark that also in your calendars because i think arjun is doing an amazing job on the play and it'll also be in some sense one more of our tributes to girish by producing his last play so with this uh, i'm done with introducing the new india foundation and i think uh, Srinath will now introduce the speaker. Srinath? Oh, just one more thing. Uh, uh, you know, the original two co founders of this con conspiracy were Ram and I, and uh, somewhere along the way we realized that we're getting old and feeble. So we said we need to bring in younger people into uh, the, the whole foundation, and that's how Srinath Raghavan and Mani Sabarwal became trustees. And we have benefited enormously from their contribution, their energy, their enthusiasm, and now all that we do is come and give opening statements and they do all the work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nandan, and good evening, everyone. I'm absolutely privileged to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, who is chief scientist at the World Health Organization. Previously, she was the WHO's Deputy Director General for Programs, a pediatrician and a globally recognized researcher on tuberculosis and HIV. She has over three decades of experience in clinical care research and has worked throughout her career to translate research into impactful programs. Now, I don't want to summarize her CV, which runs into at least 60 pages, uh, and that will take up most of the lecture time. But let me just walk you through uh, some of her major sort of roles and contributions. Dr. Swaminathan was Secretary to the Government of India for Health Research and she was Director General of the Indian Council on Medical Research from 2015 to 2017. In that position, she focused on bringing science and evidence into health policy making, building research capacity in Indian medical schools and forging South-South partnerships in health sciences. Earlier, from 2009 to 11, she also served as coordinator for the UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, WHO special program for research and training in tropical diseases in Geneva. Dr. Swaminathan was trained in India, in the United Kingdom, and in the United States. Throughout her career, she has published more than 350 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. She's an elected foreign fellow of the US National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of all three academies of science in India. She has previously been on several WHO and global advisory bodies and committees, including the WHO expert panel to review global strategy and plan of action on public health, innovation, and intellectual property. The strategic and technical advisory group of the Global TB Department at WHO, and most recently was the co-chair of the Lancet Commission on Tuberculosis. Today, she'll be talking to us about the road to universal healthcare. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandhya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I should first thank uh, Ram for having invited me to, to deliver what was then the 13th New India Foundation lecture. This was a few months ago. And we um, decided that the, the best the, or the most reliable way uh, for me to give a commitment was to plan to do it when I was on my annual leave in India. Because otherwise, I never know where I'm going to be, which part of the world. I'll be in. So we decided on, on this date. And then, of course, we had the very unfortunate uh, event of the passing away of uh, Girish Karnad. And, and then a few weeks after that, Ram wrote saying that, you know, we've decided to name this uh, lecture as uh, in his name. And I was really, as it is, I felt honored to be selected to give this lecture after the kind of people who have given it. But then to be giving the first uh, Girish Karnad memorial lecture is a, is a truly, truly humbling experience. And I feel very privileged and honored to have uh, to, the opportunity to do this. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank the trustees of the foundation, but also the family. And thank you, Saras and Raghu. Um, I think, you know, many words could be said about him, and I will try as well. But it would be hard to really, I think, encapsulate uh, the spirit of what he was and, and what a multifaceted personality he he is so 
so this evening, um, you know, of course, I would. My, the topic is about universal health coverage, and what I would try to do is also to link between the need for research and development, innovation, and most importantly, access. Because I think as we live today, and especially Bangalore being a hub of uh, innovation, of startups, I've already met at least 10 people outside who are doing such interesting work and uh, are entrepreneurs in the health area. But I think we need to collectively think about uh, how do we take it to the next level and how do we make sure that all this innovation that's happening in India actually starts having an impact uh, on people's health. So I'm sure that you know the combined intellect of people in this room, the really erudite audience, we could brainstorm a little bit perhaps on uh, what could be some of the key policy levers that we need to, because we, as I will show you during this talk, we need to accelerate quite rapidly if we are going to achieve the sustainable development goal, particularly SDG3 uh, on health. So let me start by paying tribute uh, to Girish Karnad. Uh, since this lecture is for whom the, this lecture is named, of course, he's best known for the plays he wrote, the films he directed, for acting in over 100 films and television shows. I've watched Samskara several times, and it never fails to, to move me. For his obsession with history, for his fluency in six languages, for being given the, the Gyan Peter Award, the Padma Bhushan, and so on, but he had extensive connections to public health, to medicine, to science, and of course to activism. And I think all of these themes are actually linked with what we're going to discuss today. As Nandan just mentioned, I've, whatever I say about him, obviously I've read and tried to gather from what's available. Growing up in Sirsi, I understand father was a doctor and, and, and did postmortems. Perhaps he was a forensic specialist. And, um, He's written in his autobiography about the experience of growing up in that hospital compound and, and witnessing all kinds of, he, he describes uh, unexpected and theatrical events that would be constantly happening in the hospital compound. And he and his sister uh, were premature bystanders to, to all of those. But he also says they stayed away assiduously from that corner room where the postmortems were being conducted because they heard all these stories about the bodies lying there, which were either murders or suicides or accidents. And the image of their father cutting open those bodies was not something that they really wanted to, to see. But probably his, the, his positions that he took in later life on you know, his liberal traditions, the, on communal harmony and, and on cultural uh, diversity, probably had the formative embedding in his consciousness in, in, in Sirsi because there are also other um, events that he has described about there being a church in the vicinity of his house. And it was quite normal for his siblings and his friends and himself to attend the church service on Sunday mornings, uh, which would happen in Konkani. And um, this was a sort of non-event. And as Nandan mentioned, the fact that you know they were from um, the Chitrapu Saraswat Brahmin community, apparently once there was a chief pontiff of the Chitrapur Saraswats who was visiting their house in Sirsi, and there was no raised chair befitting the status of the pontiff. And so the family borrowed a chair, a chair from the church nearby, which was reserved for the bishop. The church had no problem that the chair was being borrowed to seat a Hindu religious head, um, says Karnad. Uh, of course, then he married a doctor, Saraswati. Thank you, ma'am, for being here this evening. His daughter is a public health clinician working in Africa to provide e equitable access to high quality health care for low income women in Kenya. And his son, Raghu, who's also here this evening, is an award winning journalist and author. So, all of these life experiences that I just narrated are quite relevant to the topic that we will discuss today. I want to start a little bit by describing what we're doing in WHO. And then I would like to talk then a little bit about the, the innovation and the access uh, uh, environment here in India. So WHO was founded 70 years ago, uh, like many of the other UN agencies after World War II. And uh, since the very beginning, health was seen as a, as a human right. It was enshrined in the constitution of the WHO. And so 
WHO has been committed to ensuring that all people everywhere, no matter where they live, can enjoy the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental human right. And that the best way to achieve that is through what we call universal health coverage, or often referred to as UHC. For many years, there was this famous conference in Alma Ata in 1978, which then came out with the Alma Ata Declaration on Primary Health Care. And that was the first time that primary health care was given such importance, and all the countries of the world attended that conference and committed to providing primary health care. But then we sort of forgot about it. Then came the era of the structural adjustments and so on. And many of the policies promoted by the World Bank really were not about providing holistic primary health care. And then the big funders, like the Global Fund and the other bilateral and multilateral donors, really started focusing on vertical programs. So you had funding for diseases, disease-specific programs, or for maternal and child health alone. And so now, after 40 years, we've come back to really discovering that what we've created is vertical silos, very often in the health system, vertical funding streams, not talking to each other. Data systems also have been created vertically. So unfortunately, again, we realize today that uh, what we really wanted to provide, a more holistic health service to people, is not what is happening. And now there's a re-emphasis again on primary health care being, uh, you know, the, should be the focus uh, and, the, and the, the route through which you can uh, actually achieve universal health coverage. We also often think about healthcare only as diagnosis and treatment. So when we get sick, we want to go to the hospital, we expect to have some diagnosis and treatment. But what we don't pay that much attention to is how to keep well the preventive aspects of uh, health, the health promotion aspects. And also following an illness, many people need chronic rehabilitative services and also very often palliative care. And majority of people, the tragedy is today that most of the people, 60% or 70% of people, or it's even higher, I think, who need pain relief today and palliation don't have access to morphine, including in India. Whereas we have a few countries like the United States where there's a huge opioid overdose epidemic because of the very loose prescribing practices of the doctors there. There have been now 70,000 deaths last year in the US just due to opioid overdose alone. So it's really a tragedy uh, that we have such extremes in the access to opioid analgesics uh, in the world today. So we mustn't forget about rehabilitation and palliation when we talk about universal health coverage. It's not just about short-term treatment. We, we also very firmly believe, as I said, it's a human right. It's one of the human rights, the right to health. And I hope one day we'll have a law on, on, on right to health in India as well. But people should not have to choose between health care and impoverishment. The reality is that uh, 400 million people today globally have no access to any kind of essential health services. I've been in countries like the Central African Republic and in the, the Congo, both the Congos. And uh, I keep thanking God that you know, we, we are in India and that you know, we're, we're it's a different world altogether. Of course, there's the conflict and the violence and the constant disruption in people's lives and the, and the terror and fleeing from home and all of that. Uh, and that partially results in basically there being no healthcare system to speak of. When Ebola, Ebola is still raging in Congo, but last year when I visited, it was in a different part of Congo, in Northern Congo. And we had all these fancy Ebola treatment centers that had been set up by the humanitarian agencies like Medicine Sans Frontier and others and WHO itself, who were tracking every patient with Ebola into the bush and, and finding all their contacts to vaccinate them. But the sad reality, I walked in the primary health care center there. There wasn't even paracetamol uh, on the shelf. It was just an empty shell of a place. And, and the local people said, you know, uh, but, you know, 10 people died of malaria and meningitis yesterday, but, you know, you're all after this one patient who had Ebola. So a lot of mistrust in the community today in that region is because they feel that that all this help coming from uh, abroad from uh, is, is because of the fear of Ebola spreading outside, not really with an intent to help the local population, because nothing as far as they can see is changing uh, in terms of healthcare provision. So it really shows that unless you have long-term systematic 
investments in primary health care. You, you can neither keep people well, neither can you prevent these kind of emergencies. A contrast is what happened in Kerala last year when the Nipah virus uh, outbreak happened, how quickly they were able to respond, how they put in place all the public health measures needed to control something like that. I mean, if it had happened in some other state of India, I'm not sure that we would have been able to detect within 24 hours that it was Nipah and put in place all the measures to control it. And only 19 people got infected. It's a highly contagious uh, illness and it's also highly fatal. 90% of people who get Nipah virus actually die. And the reality is that in the future, we're going to have more of these unknown, unexpected events and diseases. Um, we don't know when the next big flu pandemic, as you all know, in 1918 was the last big flu pandemic. It's 100 years now. And uh, I think we lost 50 million people in 1918, which at that time was a huge proportion of the, of the world's population. So the question is when that will happen, not if, because influenza virus is known to, to mutate. And so at, at one day or the other, there will be an influenza strain that's made from strains from chicken, from wild birds, from you know, swine and so on, that is able to inf not only infect humans, but spread from human to human. And then that would be basically the beginning of the next uh, pandemic. So the question of preparing for these kind of emerging infections, most of them are going to be zoonotic. The viruses we, we know are very small. I think we, it's estimated we know only one or 2% of the viruses that are present in the, in the world. There's been really no global map of viruses. So it could spring up anywhere, anytime. They mutate uh, also very rapidly. So the, the point I was trying to make really is that without primary healthcare services, which include things like disease surveillance, uh, registries, data monitoring, constant data analysis and monitoring, and, and having a cadre of trained public health people in every state, in every district, in, at the sub-district level, it would be hard to, to control and one really dreads to think uh, if something like that gets into a, you know, overpopulated cities in, in like in India, then it would be very, very hard to, to contain. So we have to prepare because once the event happens, it would probably be too late. The other thing is the financial uh, aspect of it. I mean, all of this has to happen without people having to spend out of pocket. So today in India, we have an out-of-pocket expenditure of about 65 to 70%, which means that about a third of the investments in healthcare are coming from government and about two-thirds to three-fourths from the private. And 7% um, of Indians are still pushed into poverty every year what, by what is called catastrophic health expenditures. For a poor family, somebody who has a fracture in the, in the house or a, a heart attack or something like that, really they very often need to sell their belongings, sell their jewelry and so on to get health care. And then they get you know, pushed into such a bad debt, which is hard to recover from. So that's where I think the Ayushman Bharat uh, program really um, will help because of the insurance coverage uh, that is now being provided to the 100 million families, um, the poorest 100 million families in India, about 500 million people. So the SDG3 uh, goal, the third uh, sustainable development goal is on health and well-being. And essentially, it's about having a healthy world by 2030, free of disease and so on, which is really very far from, from where we are today. But coming back to WHO and my role uh, in the introduction, um, it was mentioned that I was a deputy DG and then the chief scientist. So WHO created a science division this year for the first time in its 70 year history and I was named as a chief scientist. So I'm honored to have the first, to be the first chief scientist and I looked up, uh, thank you, a much more interesting <laughs> job than the deputy director general's job because it's really about the, the technical work of, uh, of WHO. Only three UN agencies actually have a, a chief scientist, the Euro UN Environment Program the World Meteorological Organization, and now the, the World Health Organization. So it's, it was a, an interesting statistic to find out. 
though we've always been a science based as you know who is a science based agency we do norm standards guidelines which obviously have to be based on hard evidence but we never had a explicit science division it was just implicit in everything we did so now the director general uh, dr tedros decided that we need to be much more explicit about it so my job now is uh, firstly to look at emerging areas of science and technology and to be ahead of the curve to kind of know what's coming down the road 5 10 years from now that's that could potentially impact uh, health and public health in particular and you know every new technology has benefits but it also has downsides it has risks it could be misused um or it could be used irresponsibly so i think it would be our our job and our responsibility to look at those technologies and put out some kind of guidance or framework on how to assess and how to use the example of the chinese scientist who did the gene editing experiments uh on a pair of twins for a reason that wasn't really justified at all so there are two kinds of genes that you can you can meddle with one are the somatic genes that only affect the person so if you if you want to do uh, if i have a disease and you a genetic disease and you want to cure me like sickle cell anemia thalassemia uh, i saw i see my friend anand here who's working tirelessly to develop treatment for duchenne muscular dystrophy i mean these are diseases which are caused by mutations in a single gene and very amenable to gene therapies so that's where we 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 hope that in the coming years we will have cures for these diseases the other kind of gene editing is when you can do it on the germ line on the embryonic um, genes which then get passed from generation to generation and that there's almost consensus among the scientific community in the world that we're not ready to do that because we don't know what those effects are going to be and so we shouldn't be tampering with the with the gene genes uh, in the in the germ line in the in the embryos but anyhow there are people doing it and uh, so this scientist did it of course he was condemned uh, globally including in china and um, the chinese have set up now a very high level ethics board to look at all these experiments so but we were forced to react after the event so for the future we want to be able to make sure that we have some sort of a framework and guidance um the other area i can just mention many people here are interested and in, are working in artificial intelligence and big data ai is being used more and more in all fields but also in health to predict to diagnose to to give to even provide on your phone um self care interventions the uk is just i think partnered with google to to so that you could ask alexa to to provide you information if you have some event at home and then that would actually use the nhs website information to provide you some uh, fact based uh, sensible advice so that's the way the world is is going um but there are also many papers which describe how ai algorithms if they've been trained on the wrong kind of data set could could actually give you very uh not good uh um, results so if you have um, a profile that is purely say a caucasian male uh, data set that you're training your big data algorithm on and then you apply it to africans or to asians it's quite possible that that's not going to really work or if you train on symptoms and signs of a of a particular geographic area it could be very different when you move into a different country and so we have to be extremely careful about these and um, this is where the regulatory side really needs to 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 and the fda does have some some advice on this but it's very difficult because algorithms keep improving as as you use them so an algorithm that's put into a machine today as it keeps on getting exposed to more and more data it's going to keep improving hopefully keep improving or it could go in some direction so what you have today is not the same as what you will have a year later so how do regulators really deal with that so there are many new areas which uh, we need to look into and i'll mention that a little bit because again i have the whole uh, department of digital health uh, that that we are, we are, and again we're a little bit behind everyone says oh who has finally woken up 
and uh, set up this digital health department. The world has moved way ahead. And of course, we have Nandan here who knows all about the health stack and how that's going to work in India. But every country is trying to grapple now with how do you use electronic health records? How do you um, have data standards? How do you make sure there's interoperability? How do you protect the data, the cybersecurity aspects? And, and then finally, the analytics, which often get forgotten. We, we focus so much on collecting the data. But uh, the question I keep asking is, what are we doing with that data? Are we analyzing it? Are we feeding it back? It's the community health workers who need uh, that feedback. So the SDG 3, as I said, is, uh, I, is a sort of an anchor for all the other SDGs. Because without good health, uh, it's hard to be able to see how you could have uh, economic prosperity. Because the first 1,000 days of life um, is what determines human capital. And that's where I think we need to focus uh, in the coming years. We still have about 25% of our babies being low birth weight. But even those who are born with a normal birth weight uh, start falling off the growth trajectory very early in their life. So many babies are breastfed in India, not all, but most babies who are breastfed actually grow quite well. But then beyond the age of about five to six months, they need complementary feeding. Milk, breast milk alone is not enough. And that's where we start failing. Um, either lack of time, uh, poverty, and, and the many other burdens that a woman has to uh, face. What's going happening more and more now is resorting to commercial products, to the Maggie's and the Kurkure's, um, just to keep the baby from crying, uh, is being fed processed food, unhealthy food, um, really lacking in, in nutrients. And so for all of these reasons, uh, by the age of two, a baby, a child, actually achieves 90% of brain growth and 50% of adult height. After that, it's a bit late to intervene. Our programs start at the age of three when a child joins the Anganwadi. And then, of course, we give them a meal, and then that continues with the school meal program. But we've missed the critical period of brain growth. Um, physical growth, you can always try to catch up. You can't catch up on height. In fact, if you overfeed babies after the age of three, hoping that they'll catch up, they'll become fat and prone to all kinds of other diseases, metabolic diseases. But the brain growth really is difficult to, to catch up. So I think our interventions uh, for the next generation of Indians, if we really want that intellectual and cognitive capacity to be able to grow as a nation, there's no other shortcut except to ensure that we have healthy babies who are able to thrive. And of course, education is also an important component. So it's health and education, both that go hand in hand. So the science division will focus on the areas of digital health. It will focus on research, because there are many areas uh, of research which are underfunded and neglected. Um, it was good to see that India stepped up its investments on neglected disease R&D. And that was in large part thanks to ICMR increasing its funding significantly on, on tuberculosis and uh, leprosy. Um, but what we have not, what is neglected is the non-communicable disease space. So for those of you who are not in the medical, uh, from the medical side, you know, the communicable diseases, infectious diseases, everybody understands. You know, it's a viral and bacterial infections and diseases like malaria and, and tuberculosis or HIV. But the non-communicable diseases or chronic diseases are things like diabetes, hypertension, stroke, um, cancer, chronic lung disease, and so on. And here it's, um, it's much more complex because you're not here curing anything. You can only either prevent or you can then control and try to maintain um, a good quality of life as much as possible. So our investments on research and development have been mostly on infectious diseases because that was our major burden of, of disease. But today we're in a situation where, especially in the developed states in the South, we have most, the burden is mostly non-communicable diseases, which causes both chronic ill health and disability and also mortality. Of course, as populations age, 
as our life expectancy increases, that's what you expect. You expect uh, ultimately, you know, everyone has to die of something and you will get, you know, a heart attack or, or a stroke or, or cancer or something. So definitely the incidence of these goes up as you age. But what is important, the statistic that's important here is a premature mortality due to these things. So if you look at people who, who die prematurely, that means before the age of 70, due to any of these non-communicable diseases, that is where you can actually prevent. And we see more and more in our country, people, young people, the, the age at which diabetes used to come used to be in the 60s and, or, or at most in the 50s. But today you, you know, look around and you have so many 30-year-olds who have diabetes and then chronic lung disease because of a number of risk factors, not the least of which is air pollution in many of our cities uh, today. And, and women who use solid fuel for cooking have a double burden because they have both indoor and outdoor air pollution that affects their, their lung. So I think uh, one of the, our functions in the science division would be really to analyze and look at where the needs are, where the priorities are for investments and where the funding is actually flowing and then encourage each country to do that as well. So for India, for example, I think we need to be able to articulate, the health ministry should be leading this, but with, with others, what are really the needs uh, of the population and the healthcare system today? We tried when I was in the ICMR to launch a big program for hypertension treatment. You know, about 25% of adults in India have high blood pressure um, and less than 10% of them have it under control, uh, either because they've never tested it, they don't know they have high blood pressure or they have tested it at some point, but it just doesn't, you know, they don't think they should be on treatment, nobody's explained to them or it's just too problematic and difficult to keep going back and picking up the medicines from the government hospital. So what should have been a very simple thing screen everybody who comes into the primary health care center. Okay, you'll find 20, 25% of adults with hypertension, put them on treatment, and then, you know, they have to be on treatment lifelong. So you have to monitor them. But then you break it down and you realize at each step there was a challenge. There was no functioning BP machine in many of the primary health care centers. What are the, what's the standard for a good digital blood pressure machine that, you know, should be there in every primary health care center? Doctors were not and nurses were not uh, it, it wasn't part of their training to take everybody's blood pressure as they came in. Then the drugs were not there because nobody had anticipated that so many people would need high blood pressure treatment. So the drugs ran out and some states like Tamil Nadu and I think Karnataka as well have good supply chain and good procurement uh, systems in place. But other states were struggling to procure simple medicines. It's, it's not the cost because you have generic medicines which are at low cost. And then the question of how do you then track these people? They take 15 days of treatment and they disappear. And that's not going to help that person at all. The same person is the one who's going to then get a stroke uh, at the age of 40 or 45 and end up occupying a hospital bed and a lot of expenditure. You know, we a few years ago, the government announced setting up dialysis centers, one in every uh, district, because people with chronic kidney disease need dialysis. It's far too expensive in the private sector and renal transplants are not an option for many. So the solution was to, was to set up this. But the question is, it's like having a tap in a bucket with a hole at the bottom, because you're not treating the basic reasons why that person or more people are going to get chronic kidney disease. It's hypertension and diabetes are the two most important and both are treatable. So Setting up the dialysis centers, of course, will suck more and more money. Cardiac uh, stenting today, I think, is the single largest uh, payout from the Ayushman Bharat insurance program, especially in the southern state. So again, it's very interesting to see what procedures are happening in, in, in Chhattisgarh and Bihar and Jharkhand. Uh, the, most of the payouts are happening for institutional deliveries and cesarean sections and cataract surgeries. But in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, the payouts are all happening for stenting, for cardiac procedures, um, and for much more high-end surgery. So again, it's also a question of the supply. If you don't have hospitals that can do all of that in the middle of Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, you're not going to 
people are not going to be able to re re use their insurance coverage. So this is where both sides have to be looked at uh, in a balanced way. This insurance coverage can help, of course, prevent people spending out of pocket, but they need a good hospital to go to, either a public or a private hospital, which provides those services. Otherwise, insurance coverage alone is not going to improve. And insurance coverage alone, without focusing on improving primary health care, is only going to lead to increasing expenditures. And we've seen what's happened in the United States and so on. It's unsustainable and, and untenable. So the last thing I'll say about the WHO division that I lead is that we set up also an innovation hub. And again, this is in order to look at innovations that are happening all over the world, uh, particularly in Africa and Asia, affordable innovations, and, um, and trying to evaluate them, validate them, and then have some mechanisms for scale up. Because of course, we work with ministries uh, of health, and we also work with many other partners who, who fund uh, innovations, like the Grand Challenges programs. Um, but really, what, gets, what happens is that there's a promising innovation there's a small pilot to demonstrate that it's working. I've seen many like that here in India, including a bracelet. And many of them are actually Bangalore-based or Hyderabad-based entrepreneurs who've developed these uh, very beautiful things for breast cancer screening, for, for tracking uh, small newborn babies' temperatures at home so that it would alarm, you know, the baby's temperature drops. You know, the baby might be going in for an infection. And uh, very often the mother doesn't know how to uh, what to do, uh, or she finds out too late when the baby's too sick. So uh, a simple uh, wristband worn, which, which beeps when the baby's temperature drops, alerts her, and then she can then contact her nurse. So these are the kind of things that could be used, both in rural and urban areas. But there needs to be a body, either nationally, or of course, WHO could play that role globally, that can then say, well, this particular innovation has gone through all of these the testing and validation that it needs. There's enough evidence behind it, and it, it could be then scaled up, and ministries of health could start investing, investing. And of course, countries do need to start investing much more in health um, and, and much more in innovations as well, which our national health mission needs to do. <clears throat> Now, India's progress towards universal health coverage, how are we doing? It's clear that no country has achieved UHC without investing in, uh, in, in financing it. You have to, and I think our government has committed to increasing the financing for health to at least 2.5% of GDP by 2022. If you look at our neighboring countries or if you look at the BRICS, we are still among the lowest uh, in terms of in investment as a percentage of GDP. It's just about... Uh, less than 4% of GDP invested in health. Most of the BRICS countries are in the range of 8 to 10%, and, and, and so are Thailand and Sri Lanka, and so on. So our performance in, U, in UHC as measured in the MDG era, we looked mainly at maternal and child health services, immunization um, coverage, and, um, and as well as health systems uh, outputs. And um, it, the, the data show that about at least 40% of our population still not covered with, uh, with essential health services. And if you look at health outcomes data, there's clearly a, a gradient. You have the scheduled tribes that have the, all the worst indicators, whether you take infant mortality, maternal mortality, you know, immunization coverage, undernutrition, stunting, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, worst in the, in the scheduled tribes, then come the scheduled castes and then the others. So this, again, shows that uh, one is access to healthcare itself, uh, because I've been in many tribal areas, and it's, it's really, really hard uh, for those people. They have to trek very often miles to, to access a primary healthcare center or a sub-center. But also, it's the other factors, and what we call the social and environmental determinants of health, which is the housing, the safe water, the sanitation services, and nutrition. So all of these, of course, impact on health. And we know that there are gradients mm, in the country. So we always have to keep in mind, I think, equity. So that's a point also when we think about delivering a particular service, 
we need to start thinking about how is this going to be delivered in that remote tribal hamlet. What also came as a surprise to us when, again, when I was in the ICMR, we conducted studies in the tribal area. We took five tribal areas in the country and looked at what are the common health problems there and what are people really suffering from and dying from. If you ask somebody, they would say, oh, yeah, they must be dying of malaria or tuberculosis. But do you know what the number one cause of uh, death was? It was stroke because of, well, a number of factors, high blood pressure, very poor diets, you know, high salt. But it came as quite a surprise that the stroke incidence and prevalence was highest in, in the tribal communities. Of course, closely followed by tuberculosis and malaria. So it's not that people who are living in rural or tribal areas have a healthy lifestyle and therefore they don't have any of these diseases that we consider to be more diseases of the people who are well off. It's not true at all. Again, another pan-India study we coordinated called the INDIAB study showed that the highest rates of increase in diabetes are among the urban poor. And again, it's lifestyle. It's, it's uh, dependent on a very high cereal diet uh, very little dietary diversity, uh, cannot really afford to purchase a lot of fruits and vegetables. Of course, we have our guidelines, you know, eat five helpings of fruits and vegetables and so much of protein. And But unless it's affordable, it's not going to happen. And then physical inactivity, tobacco, alcohol. So these are the four. So unhealthy diets, tobacco, physical activity and alcohol are the four biggest risk factors today for disease burden in the country. And all of these are something that one can do something about at the policy level as well. But it needs a lot of uh, coordination and a lot of thinking. So as I said, the Ayushman Bharat uh, program does have a proposal to, to strengthen primary health care services through what they call the health and wellness centers, which, were, which are basically what used to be called the sub-centers. They'll be upgraded to health and wellness centers. You'll have hopefully a doctor there, a nurse, uh, and one other health provider, basic medicines, basic diagnostic tests. And this will cater to about 5,000 people. Again, it's all focused on the rural areas. Unfortunately, we have not done much in the urban areas. And it's in fact, that's where now more and more the majority of India is going to live in urban areas and therefore thinking about urban primary health care is, is going to be equally important. But it can only happen if, if first of all it becomes the top priority um, of the country. It has to be a, a political priority. So understand about 30 years ago this is what happened in Thailand at the time of elections. There was one political party where of course there were always champions for universal health coverage but they convinced that party to put it on their agenda, uh, on the election manifesto, and to campaign on the grounds of universal health coverage, what they call the 30 baht scheme at that time. So for a minimal payment, you would get. But what happened was that after that, most governments continued with that policy. And in fact, for about five years, they took a very bold step of not investing in any tertiary hospitals from the government and only investing in primary health care. And today, they have a fantastic network of primary health care centers. I had the opportunity to visit one of their northern districts bordering with Lao, And it was really very impressive to see people in their homes, farmers, getting uh, dialysis, uh, the ambulatory dialysis, which you can actually do at home, where the wife and daughter had been trained. And this man had been alive for six years uh, on dialysis with a fairly good quality of life and at much lower cost than the big dialysis, hemodialysis centers family health centers, you know, with a nurse, a well-trained nurse, and then doctors available at the PHC level, ambulance to transport the sick, excellent trauma care services at the district hospital. So they had built up that whole tiered system of, of health care in a very thoughtful manner, but it was done with a very difficult decision uh, politically of not investing in big hospitals, because those are the most visible things that people like to put up. It's like roads and bridges, uh, hospitals, but they don't really, they're not really going to address our, our health problem uh, in the long run. Now, 
I mentioned about the research and development for the non-communicable uh, diseases. We, the questions that I have also are really about why is, does Indian pharma not invest in, in R&D uh, in a big way? I know we have Kiran and others in the audience who know, who have invested. But if you look at uh, overall, uh, the new drugs or new vaccines uh, that have come out uh, of India, it's very, very small compared to the number of industry we do have in the sense that we supply a huge amount of the world's vaccine needs, something like about 40 to 50 percent of the global uh, vaccine supply actually comes from India. Uh, Gavi would not be able to supply the world if you know India stopped uh, making those vaccines. Similarly, generic drugs, I understand about 40 percent of generic drugs in the US that are dispersed are coming from Indian manufacturers. So we certainly have the capacity and we've been, we've had several examples where we've, our industry has really stepped up to the challenge and been able to provide at a time of global crisis, the products that are needed, you know, whether it was a meningococcal vaccine or it was a Tamiflu or now also in the field of diagnostics, I think we're making good progress. So we have a mature uh, sector, manufacturing sector. And, uh, how can we invest more in innovation? And I think this is where the ecosystem is important. Um, and again, this is where I think people from the industry probably have a much better insight into what those challenges are in really taking uh, an innovative product. I know even recently that one of our companies went outside the country and very often many of them do for phase one studies of a new drug or a, or a new vaccine because we just don't have those facilities. So I think one has to look end to end um, really to think about, okay, somebody has created this affordable new diagnostic. Uh, again, as I said, many of them coming out of Bangalore, I know diagnostic platforms now very innovative, which can detect multiple infections, which could really give a global competition to the big players out there, but struggling really to take it through all the different steps of validation uh, and through all the clinical studies that are needed, the clinical trials that are needed uh, in order for it to meet the regulatory benchmarks um, because it has to meet, of course, our own regulatory benchmarks, but also global in order for it to be to reach a global market. So we still have, uh, you know, a long way to go, I think, in this, but I think we have all the ingredients. We have all the ingredients, but we have gaps which we need to really analyze and then channel our interventions in those areas. The, the last month, the World Intellectual Property Organization, they release a global innovation report every year. So they launched, in fact, here in, in Delhi, their Global Innovation Index 2019, and it was on health. So it was the report was called Creating Healthy Lives the future of medical innovation. It was widely anticipated that India would have broken into the top 50 countries. We just missed it. I think India was 52, but a huge improvement from 80. We were number 84 or something in the in the global index just five years ago. So we've moved from 84 to 52, uh, which is which is really very um, creditable, I think. It, it also showed that India was the most innovative economy in Central and Southern Asia, and that the um, innovation really outperformed relative to the GDP. And the report predicted that India will make a true impact on global innovation in the years to come. It also noted that high quality and affordable healthcare for all is important for sustainable economic growth and the overall quality of life of its citizens. And that medical innovations are critical for closing the gaps in global healthcare provision. It also warned that R&D for health has recently slowed as a result of systems complexity and different incentives in the health sector. Um, while innovation in the pharma industry has declined, as you know, you know globally, uh, innovations in pharma are very, very complex. Few large multinationals really taking over uh, and buying up many of the smaller companies. 
and their focus really like for example they've moved away from antibiotics really into the more into the sector of lifestyle more drugs for obesity for blood pressure for cancer and so on many of them are very expensive they are patented um, and there's a huge gap really now in the new antibiotics sector as you know we have a growing incidence of drug resistance what's called antimicrobial uh, resistance this is due to many factors but the fact is that and the warnings are that we may be back to the pre penicillin era very soon you know before that there was no treatment for infection so you either got cured naturally your immune system or you died um, and more and more bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics which means that you will reach that stage where there won't be an antibiotic really to cure your infection so while we have to preserve the antibiotics we have through good stewardship and good policies on how we use them especially in the animal sector uh, as you know antibiotics are used as growth promoters and um, the economist had a very nice uh, cartoon on the size of uh, chicken uh, you know i think they had like 1960s mid 1960s the size of a 10 month old chicken and then they had one in the mid 1990s and then they had one today i mean the chickens have really become so huge and uh, one of the things is the growth promoters they add uh, antibiotics so that uh, you know they it helps them to gain weight and they don't get sick but the result of that is antibiotics in the environment in the water in the soil leading to more and more drug resistance so i know companies in india by small biotech again startups that are interested in developing new antibiotics but there's no funding to take them beyond the initial proof of concept stage and the big companies are not investing anymore so we we might really end up with a with a very difficult situation um the report also talks about innovations in other fields especially in digital technologies uh, saying that that's providing really the biggest disruption in healthcare and will affect many uh, sectors beyond health uh, innovation in the field of health now massively evolves around big data internet of things and artificial intelligence entailing huge power shifts within and away from the health sector of course we have also a number of our uh, you know science ministries and so on that invest in innovations we have dbt and the birac the icmr and the and the dst but as i said the next steps are needed we we need a regulation for for new products quality is really important we still have about 10% of medicines in any pharmacy if you pick up they're going to be substandard or falsified medicines and this also creates a very bad reputation for us globally uh, it's not only an indian phenomenon but it's a phenomenon that needs to be taken very seriously by the regulators and the state regulators need to up their game and make sure that you know strict action is taken whenever there's a problem found in the quality of medicines assistance in clinical and government e marketplace uh, validation then strengthening of testing and standardized laboratories having advisory bodies to mentor new startups creating contract manufacturing hubs that would enable startups in prototypes and manufacturing and so on there could be also investments in uh, r&d which include things like access agreement so that's one of the things that we're also trying to work on is what could be a good access policy especially when you have um r&d which is funded through public money so if you have the government investing very heavily in r&d and that ip then you know being given to a private company to take forward what sort of ag access agreements and clauses on pricing could one put in place uh, i think this could be a win win because the initial investment is a risky one that comes from the public sector but once a product is past the proof of concept the private sector then is willing to invest in that product and bring it out but there needs to be an understanding about uh, either a differential pricing or some other kind of access agreement where you know at least the uh, the population of the country the poor particularly would benefit and this is something that uh, i find hard to to understand how the us which is the largest uh, funder of biomedical research the nih spends 34 billion dollars a year so it dwarfs any other funding agency you know by probably 25 30 times and this year i think their budget has gone up to 38 
billion dollars um, a lot of the intellectual property that's that comes out of that is given away to to companies who then make the product and sell it many of the gene therapies today are like that um, and the car t cells for cancer at incredibly high prices uh, because there is no access policy that's been built into that i think we we can do we can do much better of course we we should invest more as well in early stage r and d but then bring these access uh, clauses in and then also look at what are the other factors like the price control policies and others which might actually be having a disincentive on investment in innovation what is good is we had a national essential medicines list for a long long time who's essential medicine list dates back i think to 1940s uh, but very recently we also have now national diagnostic essential diagnostics list and a medical devices list because for too long these were neglected without a good diagnosis you can't have appropriate treatment so we need to have the prioritization for medical devices particularly now there's the era of uh, of uh, wearable devices all kinds of wearable devices now all kinds of new materials which tell you i mean i think nowadays your phone tells you your watch tells you a lot about your own health but more and more those things which we wear on our bodies are going to tell us not only about our heart rate and our uh, how many steps we've taken in a day but we'll also be able to monitor blood sugar and other metabolites uh, through the the skin itself without having to take any blood so we're not very far away from from that um there are you know thin skin like uh, which you can hardly see which you can wear which will monitor your heart rate and uh, heart rate variability so it's just exploding this this whole area of uh, of wearable devices and uh, there isn't a clear uh, framework for how we're going to either regulate them and use them or um, incorporate the data that so there's going to be huge amounts of data coming as well from all of these devices how is it going to be really used to inform both the individual but also at the more at the community level uh, or at the state level about what uh, is happening to your population and this is something which even i find it very hard to grasp because the amount of data we're talking about is is quite huge and it's going to be personal data Uh, your individual demographic it's going to be data coming from the devices it's going to be hospital information stored data um, in the electronic health records but really what we need to think about is how does all of this going to merge and i think the training of the healthcare providers is going to be important as you know in our country we have a shortage of the health workforce it's not just a shortage of doctors and nurses which is there uh it's below the who benchmark but it's in equal in equal distribution in the across the states again i think the southern states have adequate numbers of healthcare providers the moment you go into the northern states you find that it it drops down but it's also the quality and i think there was a report last year from the who that even so called allopathic practitioners only about half of them actually had a degree so who are these other half who are practicing allopathic uh, medicine um and similarly for each of the if you go into the rural areas if you talk about having a physiotherapist or a dentist you're not going to find anybody there so the moment you start talking about these other ancillary services you face again a huge mismatch between states and between urban and rural and between those who can afford the private and those who cannot so so i think um the human i'm talking about human resources we need to really focus and i hope now the national medical commission that's going to replace the medical council of india will look very carefully into how to develop a cadre of of uh, healthcare providers not necessarily doctors but who can provide reasonable and good quality primary healthcare services you don't they don't need to know about every special uh, specialization but should be able to manage somebody and give a lot of advice and counseling i want to mention mental health as well because that's really a neglected area and who has made that a high priority because it's one of the most common um disabilities 
that we have, if you look at it globally. And in India, the Nimhan survey of mental health disorders showed that about 13% of Indians suffer from a mental health disorder at any point of time. Out of that, about 3 or 4% is severe psychiatric disorders, but the rest of it is depression, anxiety, and so on, which everyone goes through. But the fact is that there is no provision for detecting or, uh, or offering any kind of um, uh, support. And when we did the Global Burden of Disease study, one thing that really stood out was when we looked at suicides, it was very shocking, uh, the statistic that came out, and which was that between the ages of 15 and 29 years uh, in India, suicide is a leading cause of death of young people. And this is true in other parts of the world as well. If you look at Latin America, it's, of course, homicides is, is uh, relatively more there. Homicides, injuries, violence, suicide, leading cause of death of young people. And every day we read in the newspapers about young kids in, in schools and colleges who are you know, taking their lives. And that's really a tragedy that our young people of 16, 18, 21 uh, are taking their lives, uh, you know, and nobody's been able to detect or offer them, you know, the support they needed when, before they reached the, uh, the point of no return where they, you know, become suicidal. So mental health, again, we have five, 7,000 psychiatrists in the country. I'm told we have more Indian psychiatrists in the US than we have in India. This is a statistic. One of the psychiatrists who lives in Britain told me, though that's sad, but with 7,000 psychiatrists in the country, we're not going to be able to provide a psychiatrist for every, and you don't need it. So what you need, again, is a system that, um, where a, an um, MBBS doctor or even a nurse can be trained to detect, uh, for example, uh, postnatal depression, which is very common among women and which impacts not only the woman, but also the care that she's giving for her baby. If you can detect and be able to, it just needs a bit of counseling and support for her to come out of it. Um, I was very impressed when I went to the Nimhans a couple of years ago and saw the program called ECHO that they run. And I'm quite proud that one of my co-AFMC um, alumni was the one who thought of it. He, he's based in uh, Arizona. But basically what it is, is it's about uh, providing mentorship. So it's, it's tele-mentoring in a way. Um, so you have the Nimhans doctors sitting in the hub here who are connected with a hundred other doctors in different parts of the world. You can actually see them on the screen. And uh, they are discussing a particular topic. Uh, at that time, it was alcohol withdrawal because this was a time when Bihar had just introduced prohibition. And there were this huge number of cases of very acute and severe alcohol withdrawal uh, were showing up at the primary health care centers, the doctors didn't know what to do. They didn't have a clue. And these people had severe symptoms, hallucinations. Some of them were having seizures. So the Nimhans doctors were actually handholding them. And we had doctors sitting in a primary health care center somewhere in Bihar saying, I, OK, I've given so much of uh, haloperidol. What do I do next? And uh, others are all listening and learning at the same time. So it's a two-way dialogue. It's very different from telemedicine, where it's a patient to doctor one on one. This is tele-mentoring, and I think it has the potential to reach a huge number of people. So then I introduced it for the TB program in Delhi, and I was delighted to hear that the Ministry of Health has now signed an MOU with them, uh, with the University uh, of New Mexico, to use it in the national health mission in the Ayushman Bharat program to do tele-mentoring of, of the nurses and the community health workers, possibly of the ASHAs, I don't know the details, but the fact is that they have invested in it because they realize uh, what a powerful tool it is. So I think these are the kind of tools we really need to evaluate and assess. Not every digital technology is going to imp improve health outcomes. In fact, if you really look at the literature, a number of, uh, if you properly conduct a study to look at it, many of them don't show any improvement over the standard of care. So it's again, um, not, right to think that just because you're going digital, it has to be better. I think what is important is how you're using it and is it really impacting health outcomes. So you have now an app for practically everything and anything. In fact, thousands of apps that have been created for health as well. But are those apps really helping? Um, so, so research needs to be done also to assess these tools because without that evidence, it's very hard to promote the widespread use of of these tools as well. So I wanted to give that example 
of the of the echo program how it started small with mental health and and then went to tb and hepatitis c treatment in punjab and now it's uh, in in the ministry's main program so what we need is i think again a cadre of i've always felt that there was a relative lack of interest in research in our medical institutions uh, i was never exposed to i mean exposed to research at home but not in the me medical school and i went to a very top medical school the the afmc and we learned a lot of subjects but we didn't pay any attention to statistics or to public health or community health it was a big joke for us actually it was a holiday those two weeks of community health were always treated as a bit of a have a nice time uh, not realizing that's the most important part of uh, you know what we should have been focusing on um, and uh, never taught any basics of research or exposed to anything whereas in um, the in the west the system i see is that you have options at the end of every year of medical school you take a year off you can either do a global health posting somewhere in some country or you can do a year off in research in a in a lab and that's how they develop into physician scientists and can inculcate that uh, interest uh, and uh, and understanding of science and of research and it doesn't mean that everybody must become a researcher but at least to start understanding how to interpret studies that that you read uh, how to call out the good you know from the huge amount of knowledge that one is exposed to now with the internet so that grounding needs to come in and again i hope now with the national medical commission that we have an opportunity to change the way in which we are teaching uh, medicine to our uh, youngsters and then you need an environment where i've seen very few institutions in our country where you have a multidisciplinary environment you have engineers and technologists and biologists and clinicians who can freely interact talk to each other discuss a problem and then try to evolve a solution together and and one institute is a sri chitra tirunal institute in in trivandrum that's been doing this now for quite some time and they've done a lot of innovations there of course but also more recently the transnational health science institute that was set up by dbt by dr bhan actually in faridabad is also aiming to do that so we have very few uh, places and i'm glad that a few years ago there was a decision taken that iits could also have medical campuses and i think iit kharagpur was probably the first one uh, to i don't know if that medical school has come up but there was a plan anyway to bring that and and even before the medical school came up the iit kharagpur director had a very close interaction with the medical schools in calcutta and they had a constant interaction of of uh, people going back and forth faculty as well as students i think that's absolutely necessary again because we stay in our silos our students don't uh, get exposure say to social sciences and humanities we never taught uh, never taught any you know subjects like that and neither are we taught any so soft skills like how to deal with with death or dying or or grief and so on so we're not i think uh, we don't have that holistic if you if you're lucky you have a teacher a professor who has those skills and you learn by observation but it's not uh, something that comes to everybody and that's why you find very often a, a conflict arising between the doctor and the patient because those skills are not there so i think having social science i've always felt is missing in most of what we have done and when i was at the icmr i tried to put a lot of focus on behavioral research because that is so critical for public health programs we often and now the who uh, somebody wrote to the director general saying you must set up a nudge unit because you know you have these terms now the behavioral insights nudge unit uh, of course you have behavioral economics so the director general is very keen now and he's asked me now to set up uh, a nudge unit a behavioral science unit but i think it's it's really important both in the policy making but also in the implementation of the policies because if you go to a population and just make a rule or a policy and try to implement it without understanding the societal uh, context uh, and how people are going to respond to that it's probably going to be a failure and we've seen many examples of that so i think exposure to other disciplines during training exposure to the ground realities uh, go and work in a village live in a village and it's true for other streams as well i think engineering 
we have so many engineering colleges, but then you look at our roads, you look at our bridges, you wonder, gosh, you know, who really designed this? Um, agriculture, you know, the students don't really go and live with a farmer or anything like that. So it's uh, hard to know. So it's very, very theoretical and, and academic. So I think that needs to change. It needs to be grounded really in our own realities. And it will also bring about, I think, the uh, a good understanding of what the needs are. So I think, um, you know, one could go on about, uh, about these. They have been good. I just want to say a word about corporate social responsibility and the role of uh, philanthropy, which again is thriving in Bangalore, not everywhere in India. But I think, again, they can play a major role. I think private philanthropy uh, can play a big role by investing catalytic funds in areas which are being neglected by the government or where there is a, not a capacity for the government to uh, really work. So that and the private sector and philanthropy coming together, using corporate social responsibility again to scale up these uh, innovations, all of this could be done. We have examples of, of uh, private companies who have done that. We had a malaria elimination project that we had uh, envisaged with Sun Pharma through their foundation in Mandla district of completely getting rid of malaria in 1,200 villages in Mandla and Madhya Pradesh. We had the India TB Research Consortium that we set up where it was a private public government partnership really to work together to kind of eliminate TB from the country. I'll conclude now just by saying that Girish Karnad's plays, plays used history and mythology to deal with contemporary issues. And uh, many of his works, right from Nagamandala to Hayabadna, dealt with complex social inequalities and injustices from gender to class, caste, and communalism and their roots in history and tradition. Science cannot and policy cannot ignore these social roots of inequality. I mentioned earlier about the, all the health parameters. So we must actively address equity in all our work or else the historical causes of inequity prevail and continue to create those injustices. Universal health coverage is one such aspiration that brings scientific innovations and advances to tackle long-standing social inequalities. Karnad's collaborations with leading scientific figures like Yashpal, Dr. Yashpal on the long-running television show Turning Point, showed us that science and arts must go hand in hand. Their different personalities and perspectives shown through and brought depth and richness to the show, which was very popular in the 1990s. And every serial ended with a reminder to the audience to develop a scientific temper. Science uplifts and emancipates us, whereas art humanizes and helps us understand our social context. Girish Karnad was an activist who railed against violence, inequality, and prejudice and he pushed for pluralism and tolerance. He has been called a pillar of social justice. He spoke up fearlessly for the causes he believed in. He was a true innovator. Let us imagine how those qualities so closely associated with his life can be harnessed to create a fairer and more just society where health is a fundamental human right and no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Samia, for that wonderful lecture. I'd like to begin where you ended, uh, about the importance of collaboration between science and the humanities. When we, uh, so let first let you into a secret, when we, saw, when we invited you, what was our thinking behind it? So you're the 17th New India, uh, 13th New India Foundation lecturer. We've had social workers like Ella Bhatt, we've had historians like Sunil Amrit, we've had sociologists like Andre Bete, political scientists like Yugendra Yadav, and architects like Rahul Marotra, and probably quite a few, perhaps too many economists. So I was thinking now we've had humanists, historians, social workers, architects, and we've had a, a category of people who are between science and pseudoscience. So let's get a real scientist. 
So we, that's in a sense, you know, uh, why we were reached out to you and we were delighted when you accepted. Then, of course, Girish passed away. And you said, you know, what am I doing giving the Girish Kata lecture? Now, it so turns out, and I'd like to remind the audience that this is the 60th anniversary this year is the 60th anniversary of a famous lecture given in Cambridge called The Two Cultures by C.P. Stone, uh, which is about the massive gap between the science and the humanities, that they don't talk to each other. Uh, and it, you do meet in India some people from the sciences who reach out to the humanities. I mean, Satish Dhawan, great resident of Bangalore was one, Yashpal, Vikram Sarabhai, but among, from the other side, you know, someone like me, for example, who fled from science because I was so bad at it. And you will find probably every historian, sociologist, economist in this country has absolutely no understanding of basic science. But Girish was an exception. It's not probably well known that his first degree was in mathematics. And of course, he was married uh, to a scientist himself. So in that sense, I've, I felt that your, your lecture was a wonderful tribute to Girish because it breaks the two cultures and particularly inadvertently also your, your concluding remarks. So we have a little time for questions. I have one question which I'll ask if there is time, but there are some real experts in this room. There are scientists, there are philanthropists, there are researchers. So who would like, can, Kiran, yeah. Uh, uh, Michael, yeah. Okay, so Soumya, thank you for a very, very comprehensive and elucidating lecture. Wonderful. You know, you mentioned about innovation and creating an innovation hub. And you also talked about the fact that there is so much happening uh, in India in terms of innovation and innovating. How do, how do the young startups or entrepreneurs access this innovation hub? And what are you doing in terms of WHO and innovation? Are you funding, you know, or are you sort of uh, helping to scale up some of these innovations? What, what is happening? Because I'm sure there are a lot of young startups who would love to know how they can scale up some of their, uh, you know, innovations with the help of uh, WHO. Because that's another big challenge we have in India. How do you scale up? Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. I think that's exactly the space that WHO can fill and wants to fill. It's very new. We've just set up the Innovation Hub. We will not be funding innovations. What we hope we can do is to look around the world to sort of scan for promising innovations, particularly those that are meeting unmet health needs, and then evaluate them to see if there's enough evidence. Very often, we may find there isn't enough evidence to support scale up, in which case, we could advise on what studies need to be done. We would need to partner with national governments to do this. I don't think WHO will be able to do this on its own because the sheer volume of uh, things that are happening everywhere and the breadth of it. But the idea would be to, to at least come up with an indicative list of promising new innovations, say 10, 20 every year or 50 every year, that others can then invest in. You know, because you know there's a global need for that. Uh, and then once there's the evidence, then of course it becomes a WHO guideline. It goes into policy. That really helps scale up because most governments of low income, middle income countries look to WHO guidelines and are very hesitant to scale up things which are not recommended by WHO. Though I think countries like India should and can and will do it, but many other countries don't have the capacity to assess for themselves, wait for WHO. So I think that's the critical point that our word on that can really help the scale up of promising innovations. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is a narrow one about clinical trial registries. Uh, do you use the registries for sort of landscape uh, scanning for innovations which have reached the stage of trials? And the other issue relates to the innovation that's happening in Bangalore and elsewhere. Uh, you know, if they get foreign investments, they will, will likely fall into the Western paradigm of pricing, which, as you mentioned, you know, can be very high. So would the WHO have some kind of a policy to encourage, let's say, local innovation, uh, where, you know, Western innovation may already exist, 
but which would bring the price down because it was done here and somehow it was funded also in a way to keep it low price. I think your first comment is a good, is a very good suggestion. I think we can look into the clinical trial registries to see what's already going into trials. I think that's a good suggestion. And WHO, of course, has the clinical trial registry, uh, global one. Uh, the second point uh, about um, keeping the costs affordable, I think that again has to be, it can't be WHO alone who does it because WHO is not the investor in these things. So the investors, depending on who the investor is and what kind of return they're expecting, uh, that really is the key player. So this is where I think the government needs to step in a big way. Uh, and if the, the government invests more in innovation, then they could also have the access clauses. But again, one can appeal to the private or venture capitalists and others who are, who are investing in innovation as well to see that there's also a social return on their investments. And that can only happen if it is affordable and it's going to be used at scale. So maybe it's also just bringing in that that culture. Thank you, madam. I, I had a chance to work under you. I'm in Bangalore right now. So my view about WHO's view about the gene editing processes as such, because it is a huge debate going on. Hold the mic. Gene editing processes as such, like you know, gene editing in mosquitoes, gene editing in what you call of somatic cells or the germ cell lines and disease control. What is the WHO's view right now and government of India's view right now? Because there's a lot of debate going on, to be or not to be. So maybe it's a very technical question, but I'll just say that it's one of the areas that we're looking at producing the guidance. So I think, again, we were a bit slow. And while we had already started thinking about it, this experiment in China happened in Russia. Also, there, some scientists are saying they're going to do more stuff. So we have a committee, a very knowledgeable uh, expert committee that's been set up. Uh, which is co-chaired by Edwin Cameron, incidentally, who's a Supreme Court lawyer and um, a justice in South Africa. So we have a mixture of ethicists, legal, and scientists who are looking at this. We should have some guidance out before the end of the year on gene editing. But on the mosquitoes and vectors, it's going to take some more time because that's a different issue again. So we'll keep the human separate. I don't know many people in the audience are aware or not that there's also many interventions in, in mosquitoes now including one called a gene drive, that once it's put in, it amplifies. And it can actually wipe out populations of Anopheles mosquitoes. So the environmentalists and others are a bit worried, saying, you know, if, you, if you're going to do an intervention that may wipe out a species, is that going to really have implications which we are not, uh, which can't predict? So I think th it needs a big, much bigger societal debate, I think. So that's what we want to stimulate also. We want to stimulate societal debate in countries on issues which are going to affect people. It shouldn't be decisions that are made by a few people you know, sitting in a committee room. I think it has to be much more widely debated. The same with data as well. And I think Nandan is you know, the expert here, but uh, I've seen in countries which have had that debate, there's a trust, uh, uh, the public trust really goes up in the governments handling their, their particularly the health data and using it for purposes. So these things do need to be out there. Okay, if I may ask an India specific question, you know, uh, in the course of your talk, uh, you referred to uh, the varying access to health care and uh, health provisions in different states. And you sort of suggested that South, southern states are better equipped than northern states. You give seven oh. examples. Now, one of the problems in India generally is that states don't learn from each other. They don't learn best practices, education, health, uh, you know, uh, uh, social welfare, gender equality. Uh, we know that Tamil Nadu and Kerala are ahead in many respects, but other states don't look at them. But in this general north-south comparison, in which the south usually appears better, there may be one exception, uh, which is Himachal. And it struck me that, I mean, as a sociologist, I mean, I am, as a sociologist, Himachal is a place that wasn't under British rule. It was under the most reactionary Maharajas. Um, you had uh, patriarchal Rajputs, you have hilly terrain where there's, it's very difficult to get access to schools and hospitals. So, I mean, if this is, a, I mean, I'm still waiting for a good study to explain why Himachal has done so well on health and um, education. When you would think, you know, Bengal, Bihar in the, in the plains and with access to science would do. I mean, is there 
So I mean, uh, just uh, we should really focus this kind of interest rather than New Delhi saying "asa karo, asa karo." I mean, kind of interstate communication and learning from each other. And Himachal as a counter example to this. No, I totally agree with you, and it's it is a paradox. I was also thinking about the same thing that Himachal ranks high up, even recently in the Niti Aayog rankings. Huh. It's Kerala, Himachal, Tamil Nadu. So I, I I don't have any explanation for this, and it would be definitely worth a study. Yeah, I think I mean there must be many reasons. Yeah. But your 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 reference to Thailand, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, reminded me that one possible reason in Himachal could be it had a visionary chief minister to start with, Y.S. Parwar. You know, and maybe. Part of the explanation, at least, could be in the kind of the direction he gave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, Samya, I have a question more in relation to the access and equity uh, angle you mentioned. So, as India is looking to set up these uh, health and wellness centers, and if we are looking at health as a fundamental right for citizens across the country, then picking up from Ram's point, how do you actually bridge that divide between northern and southern states and if you add to that the tribal populations, as you nicely alluded to, even their life expectancy being 10 years less than other citizens of India, what is your conception of what should be a health and wellness centers offering in India? And do you think it needs a multi-pronged approach in the sense that if some of the states don't even have the basics, then what can be offered there in a health and wellness center vis-a-vis -vis some other states or districts which are somewhat better? But then even as I say it, it goes against health being a fundamental right irrespective of the state or district you're born in. So would love your thoughts on, you know, as India is now you know, grappling with how do you define what's an offering in primary health of health and wellness center if you've got any lessons? It's a very uh, good question, important. Um, and as you know, the states of India are like many different countries and we have health parameters in the south again, which are like Europe, Western Europe, and then you have health parameters in Bihar and Jharkhand, which are like Sub-Saharan Africa. So their capacities are also very different. It has to be an incremental approach. They won't be able to go overnight, you know, to where Kerala or Tamil Nadu is today. But I think we have to start with the basics. You have to start with governance, most important. I think that's the major difference, really, between these different states, the, the leadership, the governance, and the stewardship of the healthcare system and then put in place all the other building blocks that we know are needed. You know, the supply chains, the human, well-trained human resources, the information systems, and, and so on. Um, I think involving the communities is, can be a game changer, really. And if communities start having a say in the healthcare provision they're getting and are able to provide some kind of a feedback and that brings some accountability into the into the system. And uh, again, the in Thailand, I keep going back to that because I'm really so impressed. They have the National Health Assembly. The National Health Assembly is composed of people who are coming, they're ordinary citizens who come from different parts. So they have their district health assembly, state health assembly, or the equivalent, and then a national health assembly where 2,000 people gather once a year to debate the health issues as well as the health system and feedback and the minister sitting there and listening all this i think something like that would be would be very good the other thing I, I noticed there was a health promotion agency that's funded through tobacco tax so you know if we could use our tobacco and alcohol tax to plow it back into health that would be a great thing professor yeah uh, it turns out that right to health is not a fundamental right in india i was surprised to learn that and when i did a survey most countries with a constitution do not include health as a fundamental right. And uh, so I asked the Supreme Court judge, how is it, uh, how are you dealing with uh, this dilemma? And he said, Indian constitution specifies right to life as a fundamental right. So they, the judges interpret this in an indirect way and uh, say that also you can't live a, uh, have a right to life without some health. And that's the reason. So wow. I wonder whether you're a UN agency and uh, whether you can have some impact on uh, on changing the uh, outlook of constitutions in different countries, because only UN can do that, perhaps. Very interesting point. Thank you. I, yeah, didn't know that. So, a last question. Maybe there. Yeah. 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 So you mentioned. Thank you so much for your lecture today. Uh, you mentioned uh, several points that we need to cover uh, in our country. 
But my question is really more sort of more basic. Why is it politically unattractive for us to be spending more uh, from a public health perspective? Because you mentioned capacity building, you mentioned research, you mentioned regulation. I mean, there's so many areas that we need to spend on. Obviously, money is important here. And currently, we're not spending enough, which you clearly mentioned as well. And we need to. Why, is, why does that not happen? Why is it not happening? And how can we make that happen? I don't know. I think your guess is as good as mine. Um, but it's surprising that there hasn't been a demand also for health, you know? So I think um, the last election was maybe the first one where health was even on uh, the agenda. And uh, because the Ayushman Bharat program had been announced uh, previously and then that had already rolled out. But there's neither, neither been a demand nor has there been uh, any political party really that's prioritized health. But hopefully that's changing. And like I said, if once it's done, it's very hard to go back on it. And then hopefully every uh, each government will build build on on the past. But I don't know. Do you have any insights into why health was? Uh, I, maybe we we don't prioritize health ourselves. It's possible yeah. that Indians really don't uh, think about health as as being important. And I think that's needs to change. I think that's a very. Uh, I mean, I think it would require. Uh, uh, thank you for, for that. Somewhat related to this, I think we think of uh, rights but not responsibilities often enough. And health, you said health, universal health care, but universal health comes before universal health care. So outsourcing one's health care has become actually at the root of some of these galloping ideas of medicalization of health, right? So a lot of the prevention focus back on individual responsibility. We used to not go to the doctor for everything, but if you look at the uh, lower economic classes, a headache takes them to what is called a shop in, in these parts of the world to get an injection of we don't know what. So how do we move back the culture to this? Because that's going to reduce the burden on all agencies as well. Any thoughts on this? No, you're very right. And I think we need to start thinking about wellness and how to keep yourself healthy. And that's the prevention and the health promotion, your diet and your, you know, your other habits, your physical activity and things like that. So we actually have come out recently with a whole set of self-care interventions because self-care is something that people need to know about and need to be to practice. But there are also, you know, guidelines on when you should and when you when you shouldn't. But um, again, I think an area that's really lacking in our country is health literacy. So even educated people are, uh, have all sorts of misconceptions about health. So uh, I think the media can play a very big role here in, in really improving health literacy and make people should know what is a communicable yeah. disease, what is non, what are the risk factors. So that's a very important point. I mean, it goes back uh, like yeah, body said, about 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 the media, you know, um, uh, this separation between the two cultures. If you go to a good Western newspaper, like the New York Times, you know, it is a new development in cancer research. It will be on the front page in an accessible way. Yeah. Here it will be, Virat Kohli bought a new watch, you know, <laughs> or something slightly less frivolous, but that's about it. So I think this is a very, it's part of the separation. Mm -hmm. In India, we have this huge separate, and people don't, the real, kind of quality research that's being done, even by Indian scientists, yeah. very rarely enters the public domain. Manish will give a formal vote of thanks, but before you come up, Manish, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you very much for <laughs> coming here, uh, uh, for taking time off what must be an incredibly busy schedule, for giving us a wonderful synoptic survey, which educated us on many, many things. And the audience will excuse me if I pick out one line. Uh, in, in, from, from your talk, uh, one line which uh, resonates with debates in India, in Bangalore, and dare I say it, within the modest portals of New India Foundation. And that line was, going digital is not enough. Not me. <clears throat> so thank you so much, Soumya. That was absolutely wonderful. It was insight at the intersection of disciplines that we talk about. And just after listening to you, we often hear that we're in the last mile of access 
um, in Indian healthcare. I mean, you know, I, Deng Xiaoping once said that in policy, when you're in the ninth mile of a 10 mile journey, you have done half the work. And I, 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 I don't often think about that, but you, you know, we have only done half the work in Indian healthcare. So thank you very much for that. And we'll think about it long after you're gone. Thank you, Nandan Rohini. You are the Kam Dhenus of uh, New India Foundation. And, and we really appreciate it. Ram, of course, you know, you know he's the most successful intellectual venture capitalist. 60% um, of our um, fellowships get converted to books because of him. Obviously, Ravi and the BIC team, you've been wonderful. And thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.